Right, so going to have a look at uh, instant response. So it's a, it's a uh, increasing area of activity, and uh, it's becoming uh, increasingly important with inside uh, companies. So we're going to have a little introduction into instant response, what it is, where uh, we uh, use it with inside a corporate type environment. Then we'll have a look at uh, areas such as risk analysis and risk management, and then go on to look at some uh, threats and then some fundamental areas. And what we see is that uh, we see an increasing trend around intrusions and, and hacks. So we've seen it from uh, Sony uh, quite recently uh, where the uh, emails were uh, compromised. We've also seen it in Ashley Madison and within Target. And there's an ever-increasing number of these breaches. And obviously what we need to do is to be able to detect the early signs of a, of a breach and then to be able to, to deal with it. So before we start, let's actually have a look at some of the language that we might use around an incident and to be able to uh, understand some of the terms that we might use. So this is one uh, taxonomy that's been proposed. Obviously, we an intruder will start here uh, because they have certain objectives of why they want to intrude into a network system. So we need to understand these objectives to be able to understand the motivation behind the intrusion. So it might be basic challenge or to get some status, uh, might be some political gain or some hacktivism uh, uh, reason, might be a financial gain, damage, uh, and also the destruction of an enemy, such as within cyber warfare. But if we want to be able to articulate what an intrusion really means, then we have a threat, which is achieved by some attack tools uh, for a number of vulnerabilities and with uh, certain access which results in something for certain objectives. So that's the way that we would typically articulate it. Our threats comes from a range of uh, sources, hackers, spies, terrorists, corporate readers, professional criminals uh, and so on. The attack tools might be a range of things, user commands, toolkits, autonomous agents and so on. And then the vulnerabilities is often around things like uh, information implementation vulnerabilities, such as an uh, incorrectly uh, configured firewall, it could be design vulnerabilities, uh, or it could be around uh, poor configuration. And then we've got certain access. We might access files, network traffic, uh, objects, uh, and also other things in, in transit. And then that results in something such as disclosure of intellectual property, a denial of service, and so on. So this is allows us to really understand uh, or really articulate what an incident is all about. So instant response and understanding of incidents and alerts is really all around uh, understanding data and data sources and making some sense of it, and then try to articulate uh, some sort of timeline of, of an event. So if you think about it, what we really uh, want is who did something, how they did it, uh, what they used, uh, where they did it from, and why, and obviously when. So these are the types of questions that we might ask. So an intrusion might have happened much earlier before uh, an incident is, is reported. And what we must do is to be able to trace uh, what happened before and also, of course, what happened after we've actually detected the, the incident. So these could be timelines of seconds or it could be days, months or even years that we trace back. So the three states that, that we look to be able to detect uh, an intrusion is uh, within data at rest, data in motion, and data in use. 
So the data in motion is the network traffic that flows across the network. The data in use is the data that's held with inside processes, the memory, the processor, and so on. And then data at rest is obviously the data that is stored on our disk systems. But we have a complex infrastructure of our networks. We have typically firewalls and routers and intrusion detection systems to be able to detect the intrusions. And then we have a whole range of servers which might exist in a, 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 a demilitarized zone. Then we might also have things like domain name servers and databases and so on. Each of these holds some sort of fragments of information that can be used to build up a timeline of an incident. Okay, so when we think about it, we're really trying to build up a timeline. This is where we detect it or when an incident's happening in real time. And then we must be able to trace back before the incident has been detected and then uh, what happened after that. So in terms of data at rest, it might be to do with files that are on systems, it might be looking at directories, file rights, domain rights, and so on. And especially focusing on what we would call CRUD, or create, delete, update, and delete uh, operations on, on files. And it's these operations that will allow us to define the other trails that are required to be able to detect what's happening to files when they changed and so on. It's also important that we have thumbprints. So thumbprints gives us uh, an, an identification of, uh, of a file and, and it's through that we can define unique changes. And then in data in motion, we have our network scanners, intrusion detection systems, firewalls logs and and so on and this is where much of uh, intrusion detection actually happens with inside the data in motion where companies will actually detect within data packets uh, malicious payloads so this might look at network packet logs web logs security logs and, and so on and then we have a uh, data in process that's the processes that we run the threads any memory that we have and, and so on. So again we've got security logs, application logs, registry changes, uh, domain rights and so on. I'll do with the running programs and the running system at any given time. With these three elements of data we can build up a strong picture of the timeline. It's obviously important in a system such as this to make sure that each of the events is correctly timelined uh, and we get an understanding of different time zones so we can place things together in the actions that were uh, generated. So a lot of what we're going to look at uh, in within side this module is, is around the analysis of big data, around creating uh, large amounts of alerts and data and uh, trend information and to be able to piece them all together to make some sense of an incident. So as part of uh, our big data analysis, we typically define what's called the four Vs. So the V for volume is really the amount of data that we have to process and analyze. So there can be trillions of alerts that actually happen within even such a timeline of, of a day and so on. So what we must be able to do is to be able to process the volume or at least collapse the data down so that we filter out the least important alerts and to make sure that the most important ones are there for a security analyst to make some sense of. But it's also important to also have an archive or a log of all the other events just in case we need them in some time in the future because a small scale intrusion could have happened early on and not detected in the main system and we must be able to trace back to find uh, that original source so that we can actually find out what actually happened on the system. Then we have variety is coming in. Data comes in from many sources that uh, we would see within our networked infrastructure. Uh, we obviously have computer data. We increasingly have voice data, video data. All of this data is really aggregated in and we must make some sense and to be able to cross mine across all these different uh, data sources. 
we've also got news feeds coming in uh, and so on. So increasingly, uh, companies need to analyze all these different types of uh, data. Then we get the velocity of the data, that's the speed at which it's generated. So some alerts are generated fairly slow, other ones will come through fairly fast and we must be able to process the, the speed at which the, the data is actually generated. And then, probably just as important as the other ones, we have veracity and that's whether we can really trust the data. Is the data coming from a trustworthy source such as one of our firewalls or is it coming from an external source that we really can't uh, trust because it might be spoofed? So those are the really core of what we're going to look at in terms of uh, looking at SIEM and data aggregation and making sense of our logs. So what are some of the things that we might look to uh, to be able to, to monitor and to make some sort of sense? Well, these are some of the areas here that we have. We obviously have uh, our databases, Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL. Uh, we want to be able to monitor any changes on our database, any intrusions on it. We've also got uh, typically a Microsoft infrastructure around Active Directory, making a domain. Uh, and understanding any domain changes. We have our exchange servers running on a corporate network or in the cloud and obviously our SharePoint infrastructure. We might also be running our cloud instances. So we have Amazon Web Services Cloud Trail to be able to detect uh, certain events. We have Amazon S3 data storage and obviously we can have uh, Microsoft Azure cloud instances. And then we have our application servers, the WebLogic, WebSphere, Tomcat, and so on, that are picking up uh, our uh, alerts through the activity within so their web infrastructure. Of course, we might be running our web uh, uh, services, our websites, typically uh, to Apache or, or uh, uh, IIS, Microsoft IIS. And then we've got all the logs that we would see with inside our network, such as our syslogs, SMTP, SNMP, Cisco NetFlow, SNOR, and so on, all generating alerts for our system. And then we've got our basic IT operations, uh, Nagios, NetApp, and Cisco CUCS. So these all come in and what the analyst must do is to make some sort of sense of all this data. So the data can also come in from structured sources, might be from external sources and CSV files, JSON and, and XML. So this all comes in and our systems, our analytics engines need to correlate uh, events. We also uh, have human analysts that are analyzing the, the, the alerts. So the data sources will come from many different uh, areas when we're looking at, uh, say, an investigation. So we can have our internal sources, logs from firewalls, from server logs, uh, and intrusion detection systems. Uh, but we also have uh, information, data coming in from trusted partner sites. Uh, might be to do with their logs, their uh, domain systems, and so on. But increasingly, we also get our, are getting uh, data uh, in from cloud service providers uh, or uh, as part of, a, of an analysis. We might be looking at uh, Gmail, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and, and so on. And then there is data around the communication service providers, such as location information that we might gather from uh, 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 telecoms providers and call records and also increasingly from uh, broadband and internet access. So these might be some of the investigative resources that we might bring data together from all these places to be able to build up a timeline of uh, an intrusion. Okay, so the, the focus is really on creating a, a timeline of, of activity and then to be able to find out the data sources that are really required. So we could see that we could follow Eve here. Eve switches the device on. 
makes a call, so there'll be some sort of record with inside the communication service provider. Then they might, she might connect to Wi-Fi. Again, there'll be some sort of trace with inside the communication provider. Then a tweet. Again, there might be a Twitter source for that. Then a Facebook post, a Gmail, uh, a email send. There'll be system logs that on the computer that are actually uh, uh, logged. Each time she uh, connects to a web page, it will be stored with inside the internet cache, uh, and there will also be a, a, a log of the of the access on the, the web page that she accessed, but also with inside the internet service provider. So really the focus for an investigator would be to bring together all these sources of data, uh, pin together, and then try to uh, take the identities which are defined in each of the uh, data sources and to cross-correlate them to a single identity which will pinpoint the individual or individuals in involved. So a focus of what we're going to look at is to be able to take uh, all this data. So often what would happen in a security operation center is that we might be running a SIEM package, such as Splunk, HP Arc, site, and so on, and then that will be gathering all the data from all the dev from many of the devices on the network. We might also be getting in news feeds and so on, and security alerts from, from blogs and from places like the uh, CERT uh, website. Uh, so if we see a new security alert, we might see with inside our logs, the traces of that uh, happening. Okay, so now let's, let's look at some patterns of uh, an, an intrusion to try and understand the different models. So that it's extremely difficult to actually properly define what the pattern of an intrusion looks like, uh, as everyone, every one of them will be uh, different in some sort of way. But we'll look at a generalization of what what that pattern might look like. So one model is this, it's a five stage uh, model. What we'll see is some outside reconnaissance. It's very difficult for us to do anything about this. This is really looking at an intruder, looking at DNS records and IP information and so on. Then there might be some inside reconnaissance that we would get, such as looking around at a sub-network layout where the network devices are and some sort of scanning uh, uh, across the network. After that, there might be some exploit uh, that happens, such as looking for certain weaknesses, cracking a password and so on. And this allows uh, an intruder to be able to get a foothold onto the system. Typically, this might be a low level access and then there is an escalation up through the layers of security within inside the, uh, the network. And then after this, with uh, the foothold, the intruder might move through the layers uh, of uh, rights uh, and then gain some sort of profit from, from the network. So if possible, uh, in a corporate type network, we need to have uh, intrusion detection systems set up to be able to detect the early signs of an intrusion and to hopefully uh, stop it. It's especially important with inside insider threats where someone might be in a network so that the network firewall can uh, has, has little effect on, on an insider. So we typically go from uh, yellow through amber onto red. Each of the stages is getting more serious in its scope. A model that's been created uh, fairly recent, recently is the Lockheed Martin uh, kill chain model. Uh, and it has uh, these main steps. It's kind of similar to what we saw in the last model, the five stage. It has the reconnaissance, but there, and then there is some weaponization, uh, there's some preparation for the intrusion. This might take hours to, to minutes, is, uh, months is, a, is a, a typical timeline. After that, the, the intrusion itself might actually be fairly quick with the delivery of the, uh, the attack, uh, some exploitation, and then some uh, installation. 
typically of a, a remote access uh, Trojan. After that, there is some sort of command and control that would happen, a remote command and control onto the system, and then for the to achieve the basic objective, some sort of action. Okay, so this might be active for many months, so there can be the cases where an intrusion, uh, a breach could last for uh, anything between a year and two years. So then an important aspect to understand in security is really a, a, some sort of risk model. What are the risks involved? What are the costs to mitigate against the risks? And can we actually cope with any risk? So one model we might use is to be able to look at the probability of an event, the likelihood, and also the cost of the event. So if something costs a lot to, uh, uh, to, to implement and it has a low likelihood, then it may not we the company may not be willing to, to take the hit on it as it's unlikely to happen. So something in this region is unlikely to be funded. Something with li high likelihood and low cost, such as a surge, pr uh, a surge protector or a, a lightning uh, protector, doesn't cost too much money. Uh, but in some regions of the world, it's highly likely that a system will get hit by a lightning strike. So something that's highly likely uh, and could have a high cost uh, might m might be worth uh, uh, investing in. Something with a low likelihood and a low cost, uh, again, there might be a decision about whether it was worth uh, investing in it or not. And then in this region here, as I said, the lightning protector, the lightning surge protector is probably a good example of something in this region. It's something that's highly likely and has a very low cost. So something here is likely to, to be funded in these regions. There would be some debate and then in this region here it's highly unlikely that uh, we'd be able to justify the cost with such low likelihood. So often what we do to be able to justify any cost is to come up with uh, what's called the annual loss expectancy. With this, we would actually define all the risks that we actually have, define the likelihood of them happening, such as once every 10 years or uh, 0.3 times a year and so on. Take the total cost it would cost, in this case this is a major fire in a building, and then work out what the actual total annualised cost would actually be. In this way we can actually quantify what the mitigation costs would actually be and see whether it's worthwhile. Some costs though really can't, aren't as tangible as things like fire as we might have things like brand reputation and uh, stock uh, price fluctuations. Each of the risks has some sort of probability associated with them and how likely they are. So user error is obviously a, a large sort of source of problems within a network. But we can also have things like static discharge, which can be highly likely also. And also things like fire and uh, uh, burglary. An area that is definitely a high risk is a power failure because the lossage of power on a network system can cause the whole system to uh, to have a major outage. So it's so important that we create mitigation uh, uh, procedures in, in, in the face of a power failure. So let's look basically at some risk management that we might uh, uh, be involved with. And one of the problems that we have uh, with an incident response, with an articulation of security, is that uh, it is often difficult to be able to uh, properly articulate from a technical context into a business context and vice versa. So it's important that uh, technical staff are well versed so that they can actually articulate anything that they see with inside logs and with inside the incident. Uh, to a business context and for executives 
uh, to understand the scope of any intrusions that happen with inside the organization. So this is uh, one way that we can articulate between business and technical. A threat may exploit a vulnerability which opens up for a risk which contains an unwanted incident of a certain likelihood. And, and this allows us to be able to define a standard uh, language to be able to articulate uh, our incident. And of course what we have is a mid risk, uh, uh, risk management uh, system where we identify risks as we go along. We should always document them. We analyze them, how often they're going to happen, what the consequences are, and really try to understand really the scope of anything that, that might happen understand the level of the risk at the given time, evaluate that with the current infrastructure that we have, and define whether we accept it uh, or not. If we accept the risk, we must go ahead and monitor it and make sure that we're monitoring the risk all the time. Uh, but sometimes we might treat the risk and we need to obviously update systems and, and tell uh, staff that uh, there is there is ongoing risk mitigation. So now look, ha, let's have a look. Just a random walk through some of the threats that uh, we face at, at the current time. And this is just a sample, and we'll go into some in a bit more detail in the rest of the module. So one that we might see is a rogue SSID, a rogue gateway. So what can happen is that uh, we can have rogue uh, uh, access points within a network uh, and then uh, an intruder can get a, a user to be able to connect to a road access point and onto a rogue gateway of which they can actually examine the network packets. Another issue that we have is really the lack of separation between someone's business life uh, and also their, their home life. So often the devices that we use today, we're actually using them both for business and also for home life. So these two, the data can actually mix and we're at risk whenever we take our, our devices uh, home or use them with inside the public spaces. Another problem that we have is what's called the jump off uh, between accounts. So it may happen that uh, one system has released a password uh, for a, a user, a known user, and intruder might then use that password and then try the uh, different accounts on different systems and where they jump from one to, to the next. So if possible, users should always use different passwords for different systems and regularly reset their, their passwords. So it happened with the Adobe hack, 150 million accounts were compromised and there was no sorting of the password uh, so that once the, the, uh, the hash password was cracked then it was fairly easy to find all the same passwords which used the same uh, hash. In this case, nearly 2 million people selected the password 123456 on the system closely followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So sometimes users set up really simple passwords which can be uh, cracked. Uh, so if possible, what we need to set up is, is multi-factor authentication for our users to make sure that uh, any password resets and so on are done through some sort of uh, multi-factor out-of-band uh, communication system. We might also see device poisoning. In this case, uh, Eve poisons the network so that she broadcasts her MAC address uh, for the, the gateway on the network and then can poison the route so that devices use her gateway to get out of the network and obviously she can uh, listen to the traffic. She might also send the DHCP requests into the network so that when devices are looking for an IP address, they will be told the gateway is now Eve's gateway. A major risk for us really is, is typically around uh, unpatched systems. So these are three 
of the uh, risks from unpatched systems that have been around for many years uh, and are around Java and FastPlayer and uh, Adobe PDF. If users don't patch these systems, then an intrusion typically using an exploit kit uh, can actually deliver a PDF document or a Flash uh, movie or a Java program and these have well-known vulnerabilities that can allow uh, an intruder to access a remote uh, machine. So we'll be looking at some of these exploit kits a little bit later on in the module and trying to understand what malware really looks like and how we detect it. So there's an increasing uh, risk around cyber terrorism. So nation states could could start to, to probe each other and there has been recent examples of this where nation states have uh, set up uh, Trojans with inside SCADA systems, uh, typically with inside power plants because in a cyber warfare if you bring down the power network you will uh, almost decimate the communication infrastructure for the company. We also see natural floods and obviously that national natural disasters and that can cause a great deal of effects on our IT infrastructure. Then we see things like eavesdropping, that someone can actually uh, listen to the to the communications of someone. A problem that used to happen quite often in the past is logical scanning. People leave USB sticks or they get rid of their uh, SD cards or their laptops, which they think they've erased all the data, but uh, the files are actually still on, on the system. So there can be up to half of devices that uh, are, are bought uh, through second hand uh, sources can actually have uh, data from the uh, from the original uh, owner of the of the equipment then we can have interference so in things like wireless networks it's possible for someone for to interfere with the wireless network and obviously uh, create denial of service or a, an outage of the, the wireless infrastructure. And then we need to make sure that uh, we're free from physical attacks and physical removal of equipment because we have no network infrastructure if someone actually removes the, the equipment uh, from our infrastructure. Then we have visual spying. Someone might observe the keystrokes of a user and determine what their password is. Along with that, we have things like misrepresentation, that someone might pretend that they're uh, from at the IT department and they, they need their password uh, reset, and many users will actually give their password uh, away quite freely. Increasingly, what we see is Trojan horses, and the Trojan horses is for users to be able to click on a link uh, which actually contains some malware. Once it's downloaded, it sets up a, a Trojan uh, on the on the machine and that is typically used to, to access uh, or we have what's called a RAT uh, a remote access Trojan it's a little program typically delivered through a phishing email uh, where some, the user clicks on a link it installs the RAT onto the host and then the intruder then connects in or there is a dial back to the intruder that's more typical and the intruder then goes in and will install uh, a more serious uh, exploit kit. Then we see logic bombs that might be triggered to go off at a certain time uh, or with certain uh, events. And increasingly we see, uh, well we can see things like uh, worms which will uh, propagate across the network and consume resources and in the past we've seen lots of things like viruses uh, spreading. One of the most difficult things to protect against these days is what's called the distributed denial service and that's really where we exhaust either the network uh, bandwidth or we exhaust the memory or the CPU of our devices. And it's very difficult because our devices are exposed, our web servers are exposed to the internet and it's very difficult to differentiate, in this case, between Bob 
and if the firewalls can have struggle to be able to, to tell the difference between good traffic and bad traffic. Because often these are compromised nodes on the internet and there are proxies for Eve in this case. So Eve controls by proxy, so it's almost impossible to find out where the original source is of the, the attack because Eve is hiding behind a proxy server. These can also be valid uh, computers which are running uh, on machines that the users have no idea have been compromised. We see things like active attacks, and this is especially the case for poorly written web software that probably has some sort of peril or C++ backend that causes a buffer overflow or a buffer underflow. And in this case, uh, C uh, reserves amount of space for data, and for some reason the data ends up overflowing into other memory which can corrupt the program. We can see covert channels in this case where Antrudo might hide information with inside valid network packets. In this case, the intruder is hiding the message go within the TTL field of the IP packet. And then we've obviously got things like spoofing where uh, uh, an intruder might pretend to uh, set up a, a, another device which looks perfectly valid, such as a, a, a rogue wireless access point. And impersonation too is obviously a big problem on the on the internet, where uh, intruders can pretend to be uh, other roles that they're not. And then we see things like piggybacking. It's possible to piggyback information onto valid network packets, and generally uh, an intruder will try to weave through a, a network uh, to be able to cover their their tracks. We also see authorization. Uh, attacks where uh, an intruder will generally grab a low level account and then escalate up through the levels until they get to a higher level of authorization. One area that's increasing greatly is for uh, an intruder to scrape websites that, that are valid and then to trick the user into thinking it's a valid website and then for them to click on links and for that, for the for them to, for the user to be uh, compromised in, in some way. Okay, a few fundamental areas that uh, are important when we uh, start to analyze uh, information. So the the core of what we have is that uh, we we have uh, characters that uh, that are represented in some sort of format. So we might have ASCII characters. Uh, but computer systems only really understand ones and zeros and so on. So each of these characters is represented by a binary equivalent. So with, with uh, 8 bits ASCII, uh, so an E is represented by, by that. That's, uh, that's an E, and then a B is represented by, by that. We might also have 16-bit values, but we often use 8-bit values. We then have maybe some encryption, some encoding, which will then convert it into some other format, uh, such as with a zip or encrypted files. And we end up with n what's called non-printing uh, characters. So there are only so many characters which we can actually print, which will be displayed. Other characters uh, are non-displayable. So when we look at the data, we might see something like this that's actually represented by uh, this bit pattern. So the challenge that we have is how can a human make some sort of sense of binary. So what we normally do is to be able to convert it into a format that's easy for us to to interpret or to view, such as hexadecimal, uh, base64, or we can represent it in octal. So these formats allow us to be able to view our data and set data up uh, that the computer would understand. With hexadecimal we take four bits at a time and then we convert them into an equivalent hex character. So that's quite good because we only have to count up to 15 or in hex we go 9 and then A is 10 and then 15 is F. So we break into four and then we convert our four bit value into a hex character. 
So 0, 1, 0, 1 is a 1 and a 2, and a, sorry, a 1, no 2s, a 4 and a 0, which is 5, and that's our hex character there. So if we look at this one here, we split it up into groups of 4, so there's 4 there, so that becomes no 1s, no 2s, and a 4, so that's 4 uh, there. This next one actually is an E, it's a 14, so that would be represented by an E, and and so on. So the so the values that we have we can represent really easily are long bit streams we can represent by hexadecimal digit. We all can also represent a format that's often used as a base sixty four format. With this we take a bit stream and then we group in terms of six bits at a time in chunks of twenty four bits. So then what we do is we look up a base sixty four table. So in this case we have a 1, a 2, and a 4, which is 7, uh, and a 16, which is 23, a 23 is, is uh, there, 23, which is an X. Okay, so there we go, there's our X there, the next one is an I, and so on. So we're using up uh, 24 bits at a time. So the way that we that we pad at the end is to fill up the last two six bit values with equal signs. So our base sixty four will you will often see uh, one equal sign or two equal signs, and that's usually the way we see it. For a three digit value, that's twenty four bits with eight bit encoding, twenty four bits, and we will get no equal signs. With four uh, ASCII characters, thirty two bits we can see that uh, we have, we fill up five of these places and then we've got uh, uh, a couple of bits at the end and then the 12 bits which will give us the two then. Okay, so those are the, those are the, uh, some of the main uh, formats that we would actually have. Uh, so have a look on the site to be able to look at uh, so there's a word Fred. There's the representation of Fred and hex. That's in base 64. And then there's in binary. So if we wanted, we could uh, input values in hex. There we go. And we'll convert them. So you can see there's some. Uh, if we went for something like 24. 20 and uh, say 15 and those are non-printing hex characters you can see that the characters here look a bit strange but in B64 we actually convert it into something there and there's the binary so remember what we saw cat should give us uh, uh, our B64 there okay with no equals there's our double equals appearing and there's our single equals. Okay, so every single time we add, so there we go, that doesn't have one, then we'll get our double one again, and then we'll get our single one again. And we get that. Okay, so, so try to understand how you convert between the different formats because it's important when we're searching for things, sometimes we're searching in binary or hex or ASCII or B64, and we're really just looking for that little uh, starting point for an investigation to be able to find that that gold mine of uh, of our data point to be able to uh, find the starting point for an investigation. Okay, another key concept that we have is to be able to verify that uh, uh, an entity hasn't changed at all or that an entity is the same as something else. So often what we do is we look for uh, thumbprints or hash signatures. So two common ones are MD5 which is 120 bits or 32 of those hex characters or SHA1 which is 160 bits or 40 hex characters. Uh, these two really aren't recommended especially this one 
which can cause what's called a, a, a hash collision. So these days, longer signatures are actually used, 256 bits, 384 or 512 bits, which should be almost impossible to create the same uh, thumbprint for different data. It's what's called a hash collision. Okay, so we might take some text, some data, or a file or anything, we can create our basic thumbprint actually for it. So in this case, hello, uh, dot text just says capital H-E-L-L-O, has that thumbprint there. Okay, so we can, we can find uh, our, our hash signatures uh, from our data. Just find a, a hash there. So I've got a secure set. And we'll just find our, our hash. So you should find the hashing methods here. And we'll just open up this one. So our hashes can be shown in hexadecimal or in base64. So for the thread then that's the hash uh, value there. We can also input it in hexadecimal, so sometimes we can't print the, a value, but we might be hashing uh, binary. So we can put in hex values, and it should generate a, a, a hash signature for us. Okay, so it's, uh, uh, it's important that you understand uh, really the hashing functions that, that we use. And then finally, extremely important areas is to do with regular expressions. So with regular expressions, we can actually search for things using uh, a regular expression match. So with this, what we have is that uh, we have a certain format which will define the range of characters. So in this case, we could define the characters as 0 to 9, and we want 4 of them. So in this case, this will match, say, a year of, of birth. We can have something like uh, slash D, which will identify a, a number. And then we have three characters, followed by a, a slash or a dot. So the square brackets identifies the range of characters that we might use. And then uh, followed by a four three-digit uh, value and so on. And that identifies a US uh, telephone number here. In this case, we can have an, an email address. So these are the range of characters that may, may be used. And then an addition of an at symbol. And then these characters after it. So in this case, we can identify uh, an email address. So if we have a look at an example here. So let's look at uh, this example. So we have some text here, and let's copy and paste that, and we'll just go to the site, and we'll just paste it in, it's not pasted in too well, uh, but you should find on the, the website that uh, the text should be should be there for you to paste and it'll probably come in better than it is from uh, from the PDF. But with a regular expression we can actually easily search for uh, things with inside our, our files. So let's look at uh, a simple example here. of the regular expressions that, that we saw before. So as we saw before, that's the one here, identifies an email address. So we'll just, we'll just copy this one. And this will give us our regular expression in there. this pasted in correctly. We 
just missing off some some characters there. Just didn't uh, paste correctly there. So here's the text. So we'll just paste it from here. Okay. And then we'll just uh, paste our email filter for our regular expression. It's not a great uh, email filter, but it should should do for for this example here. Uh, got an extra space in there, and there we are there. Okay, so that's that's detecting the email uh, address that we have there. So we can use uh, G, which will detect more than one. So if we do G, it will detect for the whole file in there. But obviously, if we leave that off, then it's obviously just detecting the first one and from from them. So we can have other things like uh, detecting. An IP address, which is obviously something that we often search for uh, within the side of log. So we can see that's picking it off. Unfortunately, it's picked off also a MAC address here because uh, someone has used uh, the dots in terms of the the MAC address. But you can see it's picked up that, uh, that address there. Uh, so for a telephone number, we're looking for three digits, three digits, and four digits in this case. Let's see if that exists with inside our data. And it's just not pasted in that well. So we'll just connect, just try here. And in this case, there is none there. OK, so regular expressions are an extremely important method that we would use to be able to search with inside our our data sources uh, from them. Uh, an interesting one is credit card details. Uh, MasterCard begins with a 5, American Express with a 3, and Visa with a 4. We then look for 3 digits, followed in for MasterCard by 4 digits, and then 4 digits, and 4 digits, either with a space or a slash in between, uh, will allow us to be able to detect a credit card. So let's see if we can detect credit card from the data that we have there. I don't know if there is a credit card in there. Um, there's one there. So we'll try a Visa credit card here. We'll paste that in. And there we go. So it's detected to this credit card here. Okay, so this has been an introduction to incident response. We'll go into more detail and we'll start to look at the kind of sources that we'll, we'll uh, monitor, especially around the network traffic.